Fundamentally, what is changing is that the data about you as an individual is being accumulated by you outside the doctor's office. Many people wear Fitbits. That's recording every heartbeat 24-7. 10,000 people have sent in their own stool samples for their personal microbiome. This is only just going to increase and increase and increase until 99.9% .9 of the data about you as a dynamic creature changing over time is outside of the medical record. At that point, we are going to have a complete disruption of the way medicine is practiced today. What I see the future patient doing is taking a greater control of their own health. People always ask me, like, how would I design healthcare better? I'm like, number one, I would put more health into it, you know, because right now we have a disease care model. We're not looking at health. And I think number two, I would put more care into it. Being an osteopath, I'm fortunate because I touch every patient every day. I mean, how often do you go to the doctor and you're not touched in the exam room? Larry, why don't you walk down towards that wall and then come back? You can see how he's sort of tilted to the right with his shoulders. Mike is a very, very special human being. You know, all doctors, whether they're MDs, DOs, NDs, are some of the most dedicated people in our society and some of the most selfless. What I've found very unusual about Mike is, first of all, he comes from a tradition in osteopathy which is systems-based. Unfortunately, allopathic MD medicine has become specialized based. And if you have something that only affects your kidney or your liver, well, that works. But so much of what goes wrong with the body is a system change. Larry always talks about systems and I think the big aha moment when I was first getting to know him, I was like, Larry, what do you do? And he says, well, I deal with, you know, computer science and astrophysics. He's like, really, I'm looking at entire systems. And they're multi-component, non-linear, dynamic, adaptive systems. And to me, that struck a chord because from an osteopathic medicine standpoint, the human body is a multi-component, non-linear, dynamic, adaptive system. So all of the organs are actually communicating with each other uh, all the time. So you may think, as I did, that you have a problem with your foot. But it turns out, when you have someone as gifted as Mike in system thinking and ability to lay hands on and feel these muscles and skeletons and all of the parts of you that most doctors ignore, it turns out it's actually your spine. Larry is not your typical patient. Most people think, oh, I have this diagnosis, something's wrong, please fix me now, or give me some medicine, or do some surgery to make me feel better. And Larry is constantly asking the question, why? Like, why did this happen? Let's take a deeper look at how this process happened to get to where I'm, where I'm at. He's had that curiosity his whole life. Here's who's here. Larry L. Smar is an astrophysicist. He's with the Illinois Alliance to Prevent Nuclear War. He did everything his parents told him to do. He studied very hard, and he now is a very respect respected member of the uh, community of physicists and particles and Einstein and all that. What we're talking about here are supercomputers, and their amazing feats have applications in medicine, science, the weather, and other areas of fundamental importance to humankind. The United States' most advanced supercomputer to date is the Cray-2 at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Dr. Larry Smarr is the director of the center. Welcome. Thank you. Each of these neutron stars is about the mass of the sun, and as they collide, the, each of those particles you're seeing is its trajectory in space and time is being computed by the supercomputer. And then we are taking this and putting it into sort of a souped up personal computer, which visualizes, turns those numbers into a picture. My guest today is Professor Larry Smarr of the UCSD Department of Computer Science. Uh, Professor Smarr is also the director of a new multidisciplinary research institute called the California Institute on Telecommunications and Information Technology to help develop California's technology in this coming century. I go through a lot of doctors. Um, 
I mean, if you think coming in with a pile of printouts from the web is an informed patient, I'm like the doctor's worst nightmare. His early career was focused on outer space. And then when he shows up in my office, he has all this vast amounts of data focused in on inner space. You know, that whole uh, adage of, you know, know thyself. Larry's really taking that to the nth degree on all multiple levels. That's pretty rare when you have a patient because then you can enter into this sort of dialogue with a doctor and a patient trying to discover something that might be unknown. So Larry was referred to me in the university system with a typical complaint of sciatica and I got to know him over the last couple years and this is our collaboration. I had sciatica and it was a fairly brief episode but as anyone who's ever had that uh, knows it's very painful. You, I couldn't be sitting like this um, and since I use a computer all day long that's a problem and I said well whatever let's let's try this thing you know Dio, a doctor of osteopathy you know isn't that a little woo-woo? You know I'm a hard-nosed scientist so um, I went in pretty skeptical. The kind of medicine I practice is more on the artistic side and artistic expression of medicine. And here comes this scientist who's studied so much of himself, and then he emails me two PowerPoint presentations, plus sends me a lot of his back data. Again, it's not your typical patient, but a very typical complaint. And he said, well, uh, just lay on the table and let me put my hands behind your back. And, you know, he just put his hands behind my back on my spinal cord, and he was just doing some little finger things like this, you know, and I, you know, I said, this is like, I'm paying for this, Wait, what the hell, this is not doing anything. And when he was done, I got up, and there was no more sciatica. And it never came back. And I said, okay, this I have to understand. That started the whole relationship right there, is that, that first treatment and Larry's curiosity of why that worked and how that worked. So can I have you go ahead and slouch forward slightly here and then come back up? Yeah, so I'm just doing a variety of little tests here to see where some of the tension lies, lies in him. And again, using my hands, touching a patient in a compassionate way to gather information and you can help hone in your diagnosis. Well, I gotta say, <clears throat> as a patient, it's actually a two-way street that when he's laying hands on me and talking about what he's feeling, I am learning about my body for the first time at that level of detail. And so then that gives me an intellectual input as to what I should be thinking about as to uh, not only why I've got various problems, but what I can do to alter those problems. I had a couple of things that were due to the fact that where the sciatica nerve comes out, which goes from the spine all the way to the bottom of your foot, I had knee problems and then I had this, what became uh, foot drop. And, and it's like your foot kind of gets numb. So I said, oh, I think it's time to get an MRI of your spine to see like, you know, I'm gonna get a really good clear picture of exactly where that nerve comes out. And so Larry said, well, let's do the protocol a little differently so we can turn this spine from a two-dimensional radiological image and turn that into a three-dimensional radiological image. That was kind of the game-changing in a way where I could really see in three dimensions and it was a validating process because you could palpate the spine, you can feel on the body. I'm like, okay, here's where I, f I think that I feel what might be the problem. But then to see that not only on the report, but also in three dimensions is like, that's exactly where the problem is. That to me, I mean, it was a very interesting experience because I had the patient with me in this virtual reality cave. It's so powerful to the patient to see inside themselves in all of the particularities. That's my aorta coming down. And you see that big bend that's in it before it splits on the two legs that go down mm -hmm. the leg? That's not normal. Everybody's different inside. I mean, they're sort of the same. That's why you have textbooks with the illustrations, but they're all different in detail, and it's the detail that matters. This is me. Each of these is a biomarker from either my blood or my stool 
that I have taken over the last 10 years. Each dot here represents a separate blood test or, or stool test, and then I get the numbers back. I put them in a spreadsheet, and then they uh, put them in a database, and, and then all these things are graphed. And as you, the reason for this is because as dynamic entities, we change with time. And what I wanted to do was to capture that across all of these. Now, at the time I started this, I didn't think that I was anything but healthy. And what you can see is that a lot of the things are completely green. So even though there's fluctuations, they stay within the healthy. But I started seeing something very strange. In my high sensitivity CRP, now CRP is complex reactive protein, and that is a standard medical test for whether you are in a state of inflammation, and it's a blood test. Well, it's supposed to be less than one, and you can see that doesn't even show up on here. That's down at the very bottom. I'm at least always in the one to 10 times higher than I should be, or in the orange, which is 10 to 100 times higher. And so I went into the doctor and I said, something is going wrong inside of me. I mean, I, there's some source for this inflammation, right? And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's rising, you know, really fast. So we better get on top of that. And they said, oh yeah, so um, uh, how do you feel? I, you know, it's like, well, what has that got to do with it? <laughs> and they said, well, why are you here? I said, because I've got data. They said, yeah, I'm a doctor. So like, why are you here? If you don't have a symptom, come back when you have a symptom. Well, shortly after this spike, about two weeks later, I ended up with the sharpest pain and my lower abdomen my entire life. So that really got my attention. And I said, I don't know what this is. And they gave me antibiotics for 10 days and they said, see, it dropped. I said, uh, that's five, that's not one. And so then it went along in 2009, 10, 11, and it's now up to 27. And so then I knew something was really going wrong. And I had back in 2008, after I figured out this CRP, I was wondering, well, I wonder if, there, if there's inflammation, if there's anything going on with my immune system. And I realized that my large intestine is your largest immune organ. And so I realized that if I did stool samples, they should be able to look directly at the front lines of my immunity. And when I got that, it was quite a wake up call because I found out that my lysozyme was, again, almost always in the one to 10 times above healthy. So that's your, what you call your innate immune system. And then my secretory IgA, which is the most common antibody in your gut, is really spiking high over and over again. So then that was another clue. That's your adaptive immune system. But then there's a third part of your immune system, which is the white blood cells, and particularly the white blood cells that are called neutrophils that are your killer white blood cells. And when those go after something in your uh, intestine, they uh, shed from their surface proteins that are called lactoferrin, which is now not just one to 10 times, it's over 100 times greater than healthy. And calprotectin, which is at this spike, was 50 times. And so I went into the medical literature, the published literature, and I looked up research articles on calprotectin and lactoferrin. And it turns out that these are the sensitive and specific biomarkers that are used to tell if you have inflammatory bowel disease. So I went to my doctor at that time and said, um, I think I've got IBD. And he had just done a colonoscopy, he was a veteran uh, of, of colonoscopies, and he said, you don't have IBD. If you did, I would have told you. And I showed him these charts and everything, and he says, why are you doing this? <laughs> so fortunately, at that moment, this was 2011, Dr. Bill Sanborn, who had been 20 years at the Mayo Clinic, transferred to UC San Diego to become our chief of gastroenterology. And I 
basically called him up and said, hi, I need to be your patient and you need to be my doctor because I'm going to have great data for you. Um, and uh, he was nice enough to um, put up with me, and <laughs> which takes a certain doing, you know, for a doctor. And so sure enough, we then did an MRI and found out that I had thickening in a portion of my colon, which is characteristic of Crohn's disease, which is one of the subkinds of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And so that is how I diagnosed myself and then worked with the medical establishment once I had a hypothesis, not a symptom yet, that that was the case. This part here, we can see this sigmoid colon, this is the part here called the sigmoid colon, um, is the one that has uh, the inflammation in it. So what we're going to do is now take a cutting plane and move it in this way and now flip it around and right here now you can see this yellow is a, a much uh, thicker wall than you would have expected. The, the thickness of your colon should be about three millimeters, uh, which is like the surface of a balloon. But you can see here that it's much thicker, more say like 12 uh, millimeters uh, or even 15. Uh, and that is because of the inflammation that comes with uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, I had no idea what the source of inflammation was in my body, and here it is, this is the smoking gun. Not only did I have a 3D version of that um, uh, where I could see it, but I was able to actually uh, send that 3D thing to a printer, and here's a 3D printed version of that part of me that uh, is coming down here. And so um, when I went to see Mike, I had a version of this, and he said, well, that's funny. Because when I was laying hands on your abdomen, there was this kind of inert, um, stiff piece of you that was right exactly where you have it. In fact, it must be this thing. And so again, it was this idea of, of this very skilled osteopathic training of using the hands to feel down through the body and feel things that most MDs are not taught to feel. And then having this transparent Larry including being able to 3D print pieces. Mike looks at it and says, yep, that's it. Holding this was a very powerful moment for him because a lot of times patients are experiencing a lot of pain, discomfort, or from a disease process. And they have no idea what's going on with their body, but Larry was actually able to like physically feel, there's a tactile like representation, it's like this is what's been causing a lot of my discomfort. I've become so used to looking at the inside of my body that um, I could tell we were hitting, we were, we were going toward a singularity. So something terrible was gonna happen if I didn't intervene. I, I'm not a fan of surgery, but on the other hand, in this case, I realized that um, it was essential. Larry wanted to have surgery in the ideal way. And so an ideal way to have surgery is to pre-plan it and get all of the right people in the room that we're going to be doing the surgery, plus all of the people who could help the surgeon, which is Dr. Sonia Ramamurthy here, at, uh, Chief of Colorectal Surgery, get her with as much information as possible. Jurgen Schultz, my VR guy, we went into like a two-week mad dash to create a 3D version of all the organs that were going to be involved, the aorta and the bladder and the spleen and the colon and everything. And I went over to see Sonia Ramamorthy and, um, uh, you know, and I said, look, you're going to be cutting on me and you're going to use one of the most advanced robots, the Da Vinci XI, the most third generation Da Vinci uh, surgical robot. Uh, and you're one of the top people in the country. I have no question about your skill. The question is, it's me, not the previous patient you just operated on or the previous hundred that you operated on. We're all different inside. And here's the thing, you don't know what is inside me. And yes, you've got reports from the radiologist, but you haven't gone through and it had uh, like a pilot of a plane sit in a simulator and fly through the difficult terrain you're going to go through before you fly it. And, and she said, yeah, we, we don't know how to do that. And I said, well, why don't you come over to my virtual reality cave? Uh, this was like eight days before the operation. 
was scheduled. And I said, the key thing is, where are you going to make cut A and cut B, and then you're going to take this part out and put the pieces back together? That's the key. That's what you're doing. Okay. So why don't we get in as patient and doctor in the cave together and make that decision? And that's exactly what she did. And you know, she is such a wonderful, wonderful MD. We went in the cave, this is about eight foot tall version of this. As she kept doing this, she got so excited about the transparent Larry. She says to Jurgen, hey, I need this in the operating room in eight days. And He's the was, only was, virtual reality software engineer that scrubbed into a major surgery right. that and I know about. It was also, I thought, heroic of the surgeon. We've released all of this stuff, so we're going to divide right at that rectosigmoid junction, right at the bifurcation where the bowel is laying on top of the bifurcation of the aorta there. It's exactly where we're going to divide the bowel. The idea here is that this information is coming to you before surgery. It was integrated in a way that I didn't see it for the first time at that moment. I was, I was already visualizing it before surgery. My brain was already working on it before surgery, so when I got in there, at least I've had time to process it. Can I have a dry lap, please? That's one of the wonderful things about UC San Diego is that we have pioneers just all over the place. That's the attitude. We're going to do it. We're going to control the risk. We're going to be very careful. If anything goes wrong, go back to standard operating procedure. But we are going to live in the future. The nice thing is we could look before and after at my colon, literally the month before the surgery, and you can see the horizontal part that was resected. And then now I just have this beautiful slide. I mean, I love my new colon. It just works. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's not, it's not sitting there, can't get through the opening or anything, you know, foom. It's great. That's a technical term. So. Um, but what about was what happened? I mean, just taking this inflammatory thing out, which is you know what I hypothesized was the source of the inflammation. This is my CRP on a log scale vertically. Notice the day of surgery instead of 27, I was 61. But I knew that the CRP ought to just beautifully decline, which you can see it did here. And here's the lactoferrin. So what you can see there, the green line, the first time that I ever substantially got below the green line in eight years, notice that's 1,800 times lower than my peak at 900. So it's a huge change. Two important points about the, the, surgery, the surgery. One, one important outcome was is that we had this pre-surgical planning meeting, which does not happen for surgeries. You know, time is a constraint and such, but this can be scaled in this pre-surgical planning meeting because the outcome of this was Sonia saved about 45 minutes, she estimated, of OR time. That's expensive time. But not only that, 40, from a patient's perspective, that's 45 less minutes he spent under anesthesia. And the more time you spend under anesthesia, the harder it is for you to kind of recover. 14 days after Larry had surgery, he was back to walking 10,000 steps. The other thing I just end with about the surgery is that I come back to how special Mike is. About a month before uh, the operation was scheduled for November 29th, uh, 2016, um, I went to Mike and I said, okay, what's the best, most important thing I can be doing right now? And he said, well, you need to prepare your body and mind for a very invasive activity in your body. And I said, uh, yeah, right, that sounds good. How do I do that? And he says, pay attention, spend time with the grandchildren. And so I actually went to Thanksgiving and enveloped myself in human love. I credit Mike with that depth of understanding the full human being that is going to actually be involved in a technical operation like surgery and what it takes to prepare yourself beforehand uh, so that you have the best outcome. What we're looking at in medicine, the N is a study is the number, the number of individuals in a study. The larger the individuals, the more powerful the study. But really we're seeing healthcare changing into a more personalized sense of studying yourself as N equals one. And philosophically, that's a form of self-care. You're just gathering knowledge about your own self. 
And I started finding and identifying several patients of mine who were like this and already coming to me with reams of data. So I decided to put this group of patients together. Good morning, everybody. This all started uh, a couple years ago when a patient by the name of Larry Smarr, kind of like the most quantified human being on the planet. He has more data on himself than anyone I could ever imagine. And he became my patient. We've kind of had fun together, just he and I doing some random stuff. But at some point, he tasked me that I need to find more patients like him in order to scale this process out of the patient of the future meeting a doctor that's trying to practice in this future of medicine, whatever future of healthcare, whatever that means. And at first, they were calling themselves the Little Larrys, but then they, they wanted to have a little more thing on playing on the whole space theme. And so they started calling themselves Project Apollo, which has really kind of taken off from here. I'm trained as an MD, PhD, and I was actually trained before precision medicine was even uh, recognized as a, a thing. This whole idea of precision medicine, we can get sequencing of every species of every bacteria that's in our gut at any given time during the day. We can measure biomarkers. We have wearable devices that are looking at 24-7. You know, how precise can we get and what, is, what of that data is actually clinically useful? Part of what makes this so exciting is that it's a new, um, pretty new ways of thinking in medicine. So I was trained as a systems thinker and using systems approaches to solve medical problems. And that's really what we're trying to do here. I don't think any of them can do what Larry has done to, the, to that degree, but to show that this can be scaled to a larger group of patients, and hopefully that can be a prototype to scale to other, other patients that are out there. The reason that this is going to become routine is because it's digital. And digital things are on a continuing multi-decadal exponential decline in cost. So I founded one of the first university supercomputer centers 30 years ago. And I remember in 1988, I bought the first Cray 2 that was available to universities. And it had a gigabyte of memory and ran about a billion operations a second. And it cost $15 million. That is way slower with way less memory than any smartphone today. And that's what I hope, is that technology gets to the point that's taking care of the legwork of all of this data and predictive analysis and where things are going, which gives me more time to do this with a patient. You know, because you can look at all of this data and you, have, you see graphs and everything, and it becomes very interesting seeing all of this, but I'm more interested in the person behind all of that data. Now imagine that when you go into the doctor, and they said, well, we're going to have an MRI. When you come in, here's the transparent you, maybe floating in midair, you know, with Princess Leia in the original Star Wars. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. That is all going to be possible. And so the doctor says, well, here you are, and let's just go in and look at you and, and see, you know, where there's some problems we're going to deal with. And let me tell you what I'm going to do so that you're a part of it. And that's the new future patient, future doctor.